I want you to tell me something. You sing a remarkably wide range of styles. You have sung an enormous amount of Handel and Bach. How important is that Baroque music to you in the whole spectrum of your musical life? Is it something that was used to be very important and is now fading away? Or is it still very important to you? I've never really thought of me singing Baroque music as a thing that I've done consciously or that I'm in that category because I know I'm not vocally in that category and emotionally I'm not in that category. But I have to say, if I did think, I have sung a lot of Handel, Handel a lot of Handel opera. I hoped I'd sing more Bach because I love it um, almost as much. But, and I don't really know why that happened. Perhaps it came out of my uh, idols, Janet Baker and Kathleen Ferrier, people like that singing a lot of Baroque opera. But I don't think it is that. I think uh, I love Handel opera because it is um, a close and almost Shakespearean examination of the human soul. And I think it really is almost, and it's open for debate. And it's, I always think everything is the greatest that I'm currently in love with any music. But it, for me, it's almost the greatest opera because it is standing still, these da capo arias, with a human being and watching them self-examine and examine with other people what they're feeling, not just once, but about 50 times, repeated, like, repeatedly, like a great Shakespearean soliloquy. And I feel more than anything, it doesn't move on. It gets to the heart of the matter of what people are really thinking and what they are really feeling. And of course, the music is the greatest music ever written, in my opinion. Do you really believe what you've just said? That's very interesting. Yes. You, Handel is the greatest music ever written. I feel, it's, I feel it's the greatest opera ever written on some level because of the level of human truth that exposes, of, of drama allied to the greatest music. I think there's opera where there is great music and then it moves on and great drama and then it moves on. But with Handel, I always felt like it was the greatest Shakespearean soliloquy followed by the greatest Shakespearean duet as an audience member watching another human being say I'm in love I'm in love I'm in love oh my god I'm in love I'm in love you know it could go on and on and it was everything there even in one aria and I just thought that is the greatest thing ever it's all the conversations I ever want to have with someone in one aria. But there's another side to this, I think, that is very important, and perhaps you're not aware of it, but certainly as a listener, I am, is that the Baroque demands for the voice require an inflected line that is fundamentally instrumental. Yeah. In the sense that the instruments try and imitate Good singing, great singing. Yeah. The, grit, the, the thread of the voice spinning its way through these arias, whether they're fast or slow, doesn't matter, yeah. uh, is actually the intensification of the soliloquy that you're talking about. And your sound has always responded to that in the most wonderful way. But as you become older and you start singing different sorts of music and your vocal cords get tougher, they get stronger and perhaps wider. That ability to go back to the Baroque and do with it what you always have done. I wonder whether or not it's something that you still enjoy and are you still doing it? Well, I think I'm doing it now more in lockdown than I was before because actually ah. I've had more time to stop and get some, not rest, but get some physical reassessment of what I'm doing and how I'm singing. And it's taken me back to my root. And I think I was tremendously tired actually before lockdown of singing nonstop around the world without any break and not any time to really attend to what I'm doing physically, spiritually, and what, I, what was my ground zero. And I actually feel like I'm singing better than I ever have done, better than I was four months ago now. And I've had time to really think and reassess. But, uh, 
that will always be the case, surely, as a job of a singer, it's always to respond. You can only get the truth of what you're singing from the sound world around you, from the harmony around you. It doesn't have to be just that amazing, sudden, subtle change of, 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 of key in Handel that isn't so cataclysmic as it perhaps is in other uh, later composers. But it's always, I'm always given the cues to what I'm really thinking and feeling vocally by the harmony around me. I, I'm not in ever in isolation. I, I, I understand that. And of course, you're absolutely right. And this is one way of describing chamber music, music where all the participants are hanging off each other's material and responding to it and being sensitive to it. But in order to make that music as beautiful and as intense as it deserves to be, you can't just have any old vocal equipment. And there are some singers who I adore, for instance, singing much later music, like, for instance, Verdi or Wagner, who I wouldn't want to hear them singing Handel or Bach because the voice is, is, um, has much more vibrato, uh, much less ability to change colour, and is concerned with stamina and sheer force. Now, you, you're just starting to sing these heavier roles, aren't you? Mm. Wonderfully. Yes. And I do want to do... I've got a yearning and a burning to do Wagner. I've got a yearning and a burning to unleash things that I haven't done before. But I think I always felt, because I come from two artists i come from a visual home my father is a great is a great great painter and he was painting he went through various stages in his life and he painted differently but one of the the things that i did watch him do was do abstracts that contained slight slivers of landscape and beautiful slivers of landscape and i watched my mother who is also a painter doing uh, direct portraits sitting behind her when i was a child watching her do oil paintings and pastel paintings of animals and of human beings. And growing up with all of that experience of what it takes to be a visual artist, I know that you cannot, not really, be a great artist and say something if you don't have the tools to do it, if you don't, aren't able to just draw an apple, if you aren't able to draw the chair over there faithfully. Now, I always felt and I tried to carry, cling on to it as long as I could, and I will still do it, and I, I'm continuing to do it more in lockdown, is to remind myself of that life drawing, the life drawing class as in art, is that direct response. And this is probably why I was attracted to Handel as a discipline, and I always felt that I want to be that sort of singer who can sing anything, who can sing, you know, Sing it, sing it so cleanly, so perfectly, a direct instrumental realisation before I allow myself to then veer off into being able to do anything that is impressionistic, vocally, whatever. I always wanted to have that discipline of knowing that I could sing the most fiendish music faithfully, accurately and beautifully, hopefully. And I wanted to keep that going. I never wanted to lose it. Now, I, as you get older, I'm realising that you probably have to work harder for it. And that's the last four months. I've gone back to ground zero and I found it a bit more clarity and a bit more precision again. But I always want to keep that going. Even if I stray out into Wagner, I say, say, I stray, say stray out. It's a, that's a slip of the tongue, but it's probably Freudian. Yes. No, you mustn't stray into it. You must jump into it with both feet. I um, feel like leaping in. Yeah. Is that in your life so far, is there one or two moments where you feel that you've, it's, you've been part of something that you're really happy about? I mean, like a, a recital or a concert. Is there some outstanding evening, perhaps one or two, that you will treasure forever? Well, certainly the concert we talked about, when I looked out onto the Royal Albert Hall with you standing next to me up there, and I'm thinking to myself, God, I hope I'm doing some of this right. When I'd arrived on the stage of the Royal Albert Hall at the BBC Proms 30 years later, when I got on the train actually, from, went through Crew Station, and I got on the train, the thing was going past, I thought, I'm going down to the BBC Proms and I'm going to sing the work on the stage of the Albert Hall that made me want to become a singer 30 years ago, up in the gods, and that seat will still be there. It'll be up there looking down at me and I'll be going out live on the radio, on the television, doing the thing that I said I wanted to do and I'm doing it. And you were stood next to me on that, that very night. So that was pretty, pretty special. 
whether I'm actually happy with anything, I mean, there's always landmarks like you make your debut or you do a specific uh, recital, solo recital, or you go to a city or you sing with an orchestra you want to, or you do a large work. You never, I'm never happy with all of anything. I always, it's always a mo close monitoring of that worked, that didn't work, keep going, keep going. This is working, you, 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 you know, sometimes you get into a zone and you do glide along and perhaps in a zone of inspiration, but that doesn't happen that often. And more often than not, it's self-examination as you go along and just keeping, keeping going, keeping going, keeping the faith and keeping the, the aim and hoping that people are receiving it. I too, of course, I was brought up in London. And so my initial concert experiences were at that same hall, the Albert Hall. And I can still remember some of the programs. I mean, I went for, for years, I mean, many, many concerts, uh, not always in the amphitheater, not always in the, in downstairs in the promenade. Sometimes with my family, we sat in, in different places. And remember the soloists and, and uh, the pieces? Absolutely, as if it was yesterday. And of course, I had no idea then that I, that I would stand there myself and, and try and make some music. What but I wanted to ask you was, if I'm allowed to, what, because I know that you are, because I've heard you in the concerts, you've actually broken into song in some of your great speeches. You're such a great communicator with your voice, spoken voice. And a few weeks ago, you kindly read one of my, my mother's poems. She wrote poetry in her 70s. But you're also, you broke into song, I remember memorably in, in one um, speech in, with the Halle in Manchester, and you have a brilliant singing voice. And I know you've been an instrumentalist. How is it, and what, what made you decide, I'm gonna be, and is it traumatic? I'm gonna be the silent participant in this. I am not, I'm gonna let everybody else make the noise. And is that sometimes quite upsetting that you actually want to? Because I sometimes think, my goodness, I bet Mark, as she's thinking, why the hell did she sing that phrase like that, even in a concert? I bet I could do it better. And you are very much just handing over to other people and you're making no noise. What was the choice, because you're such a communicator, to do that and to be a conductor? How did you make it? And how do you feel about that? Wow. Okay. When I was young, I played the piano a great deal. And it's a wonderful instrument for a general musician to have at his disposal to express himself and to share music making with other people. As a professional musician, I played the piano all the time for George Schulte at Covent Garden on the music staff and for other conductors as well. As a very young man, I was a repetitor and a pianist. I never had a good enough technique, but I could get by. And what I couldn't play, I sang. <laughs> I knew that when I was... Um, a young professional, you know, like when I was 22, 3, 4, that, that I, I could just about sing, okay, uh, because I had as a boy, and so the idea of singing was natural to me. But I knew that I didn't have a voice that one could ever pay money to hear. You know, there's no question. Oh, no, I don't agree. Well, <laughs> yeah, perhaps I should confess, as some of my friends know, that my singing got better almost immediately after the birth of my daughter. Um, and what it shows is that that amazingly happy event released in me something that, hadn't, that needed to be released. It made me grow up or something. Or, and, and anyway, wow. that, that's what happened. But no, I could never have been a professional singer. Um, the other thing I did, of course, with great enjoyment was play the bassoon. And uh, I realized when I was, well, before I went to university, actually, that the thought of being a professional wind player and worrying about the two bits of cane that you have to have in perfect condition <laughs> to make this up wasn't something that I was looking forward to. But I got an enormous pleasure about making music as a wind player. Mm. Uh, and since you ask, uh, all through my teens and when I was an undergraduate, I did a lot of acting. And I really enjoyed that. And um, when I got to Cambridge, it suddenly occurred to me, there I was doing all these different things. And I thought, well, were I to be a conductor, it would be a way of bringing them all together. It would be a synthesis of all these things. And that perhaps on some level, 
what I had been doing all my teens and now as I approach 2021, 20, <laughs> I was trained to be a conductor, that I had to try it, that I had to push myself towards it. And that's what I decided to be. And if you want to be a conductor in Cambridge, as many musicians know, you have to be prepared to do anything to get it to happen. And, uh, and I learned those few months and years at Cambridge, I learned about what it takes and how determined you have to be and how you have to think very clearly and then give yourself to the music. And of course, I had no experience. I had so much to learn, but um, it felt right. That's what I can say. However bad it was, I felt as if, yeah, I could get better at this. I, I ought to do this. And of course, the thing that ties it all together is singing. Because all musicians, all instrumentalists, try and imitate the greatest singing they can ever hear. When I'm standing next to you in performances singing, or if I'm sitting and it's an orchestral passage, I'm quite often very aware of the physical engagement of your body. And sometimes I think you make unconscious sounds that the audience wouldn't be able to hear, but you're almost singing internally. It's like visceral grunts or visceral engagement. It has your whole breathing apparatus, like a singer, engaged in it. And it feels like almost somebody giving birth. But I'm also aware that your role professionally, uh, supposedly, is a silent one. <laughs> and I've often wondered if it, if it's something that frustrates you or how it actually feels to you. I'm aware that in the company of many of my colleagues, I do from time to time make, make small noises. <laughs> um, the fact that it sounds as if I'm giving birth is one of the least attractive things you've ever said to me. <laughs> uh, and I had no idea that it was ever that loud. Of course, I don't hear it. Sometimes I hear it as it disappears, you know, like when you wake yourself up from snoring. And I feel terrible about it. I, I wish I didn't make any noises at all. And there are times when, and I know that I don't, um, when we're making recordings, of course. It's, it's very rare. It's not very often that this happens, that you do that. It's not something right. that happens all the time. But it certainly happens in the most profound... Oh, I don't, it depends, doesn't it? I don't know. It's, it's just something that struck me that it's your whole body, your whole being is involved. Right. But, okay, there are two things about this. It's very difficult not to make some uh, extraneous noises of some sort for any conductor. Um, and indeed for some players. I mean, Pablo Casals at the end of his life made the most astonishing noises, both as a cellist and as a conductor. Um, but I'm not proud of it, and I wish I could do without it. But I think, if I'm really honest, I never think, oh, I would have played that or sung that much better. I never think like that, because what I'm doing is, is trying to elicit a phrase or a sound in the way that I hope that it can be most beautiful. But I would like to have had a voice that was capable of singing a lot of the repertoire that I conduct. If you had, would you have chosen to be a singer instead? Would that have been enough for you? Oh, yes. I think to be a, a singer who sings great dramatic music must be the most wonderful experience. Um, but if I had gone into that path, I wouldn't have been able to consider and prepare the idea of the mental processes that a conductor needs before he can stand up and do something. But if I had a voice that could sing Verdi Simon Bocanegra, I, I would just be so thrilled to be able to do that. That's one of my roles. But, so you, <laughs> you would hand that over, because I'm kind of jealous of you, you would hand that over rather than standing in front of the full orchestra of the Met or the Halle Orchestra before we start Garantius at the, at the proms. That thing of being in the helm of, 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 of shepherding that whole work, whatever it may be, to just singing, to be, being a singer, standing there singing a role. Really? <laughs> I don't believe you. Okay, to not just be a singer. It may be that, that this is the grass is always green on the other side of the fence. I don't know. I'm extremely happy to be able to conduct when everything goes well. And when I feel I've got a cast of singers that are up to the demands of the piece, 
Um, and when I'm doing a piano concerto with a piano con pianist that I really admire, um, as happened the other day in Manchester, oh my God, just before lockdown, the beginning of the year. And I just felt so totally at ease with accompanying him in a concerto by Rachmaninoff that one can feel the opposite. <sighs> I, you know, you can feel completely inadequate and hopeless and nowhere near the soloist. If the soloist doesn't know how to be accompanied or doesn't know how to help the orchestra know what he's doing. And this man played so beautifully. And that, of course, is very, very fulfilling and, and uh, enjoyable. But seeing really great singing, I mean, goodness me, um, Bastianini, um, some of these great Italian baritones. Uh, I heard uh, on a, a radio program the other day, Fritz Wunderlich. Oh. You hear Fritz Wunderlich sing. Oh. Singing is the most important thing in the world. I mean, what he does in terms of, of move you just by a phrase uh, is phenomenal. And I know many people find this in, with, with rock singers or jazz singers or different genre of music and they get the singer that they particularly like. Well, for me, Fritz Wunderlich is pretty much at me the too. top. Me too. Um, Listening to him singing Schumann, singing Ich Groll Nicht. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's, there will never, it will never happen in any other way greater than him. It's not possible. But I think the, the answer to your question is that if I had been in help, just a very young man, to believe that I could do this and that I had the potential to become uh, a baritone, I mean, some people say I would have been a tenor, but I don't think so. I think I would be, I would have been tempted to try. Yeah. I My think dear. being a singer is far more egotistical than being a conductor, strangely. A lot of people think that conductors are maybe want to control a situation, but I feel that with you or with any great conductor, it's the opposite, that they're enabling. I think I'm quite glad that you didn't make that choice. I don't know if you feel the same. I think singing, it's, you have to be very egocentric and work, sort out what you're doing really, really a lot and stay within that and have that sphere of absolute awareness, but it's not handing over, being silent and handing over to everyone else. No, it's not. And what I what I felt drew me to want to try and conduct was I was interested in the totality of a piece. I was really, really struck having played in so many pieces as a pianist, but also as a bassoonist, tucked back in the orchestra in the middle of the texture um, and very frustrated by, you know, the bassoon parts, you know, it wasn't so often that there was something really exceptional to get your teeth into after a certain time, you know? Mm thought the idea of having the whole piece in your grasp and being responsible for the architecture of it, the pacing of it, the emotional drive of it, that was very powerful to me as something to work towards. Well, I still mm. am, of course, you know. Mm. And that's the, the great question for a conductor, isn't it? How to make the architecture, the pacing, seem organically natural. I wanted to ask you, because I'm feeling, and certainly in relationship to Manchester, I wanted to ask you a question, and to the Halle, your, your orchestra. I think everybody feels that that is the right label. I certainly do. Well, I'm feeling right now quite traumatised with the situation where I'm being told that singing is dangerous, and I feel it as a physical ownership of something that's being assaulted, and I'm feeling like singing cannot be a bad thing. It cannot be a dangerous thing. Do you have the relationship that I have where I feel physically like I wake up at night feeling sort of bereft, feeling um, traumatised is the right word. Do you have the same relationship with the group of musicians that you have built so, so much with, that you've shared so, so much with over decades of trust and these amazing performances and these amazing recordings and this, this, this identity as being... Manchester's orchestra, that it's part of your body, part of your psyche, part of your identity in the way that I feel about my own body and my own singing, and that it's threat 
that any lack of support for it now in these difficult times is hitting you like the body blow I'm describing? Uh, yes, in, in a way. I hadn't quite thought of it as um, devastating as a body blow. But you're right, I'm feeling very bereft of the contact with these musicians who I know well. And I'm feeling saddened that we can't do what we are able to do and have been doing for such a long time. But because I spend so much of my time thinking about it and planning the future and discussing how it's going to happen and all that sort of thing, I'm determined not to lose heart. I'm determined, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I decided very quickly was that I must not cry over spilt milk. I mustn't think about what's gone, what's going to be cancelled, you know? I just want to think about how we're going to get back, what's it going to take, are we going to be ready, what are the problems on the way, so that I feel very connected to them all. I wish I could see them. I wish I, you know, I talked to some of them, you know, see how they're getting on. One, of, one wife of one of the players told me, well, I'm keeping him busy, she said. Of course, for an hour of, of, of yoga in the morning, followed by 15 minutes of weightlifting. I thought, there's a merry household. Um, no, I, oh. I wish I could see them and, and keep in contact with them and, um, and so that we look forward together. Uh, and it will be an extraordinary moment when we, when we actually meet in any, in any size. I mean, it'll be some time before it'll be the whole orchestra. And I just hope that we can organise some events, some music making for, for groups in the orchestra, you know, however many we can get into our wonderful St. Beats. The idea of the Bridgewater Hall without the Halle or even some of the orchestra in there, making that sound, going out into that community. I mean, all the concerts that we've shared together, I've been lucky enough to be witness to, I mean, we've been there um, in that extraordinary concert after the Manchester Arena bombing, uh, where it truly was an outpouring from the orchestra and the choir and you towards the audience and back again. It was a reciprocal thing that we were really feeding the community and they were feeding us and we were supporting each other. The thought that we can't get out into that anytime soon is not thinkable. So it's going to be the most, isn't it, the most amazing moment to know when you get back on that stage that you are continuing to be part of that community. I really do feel, because since I was a child, I went to the Free Trade Hall to hear the, I mean, I'm a Northern girl, to hear the Halle with Janet Baker singing. The idea of Manchester without the Halle making music at the centre of that city to me is unthinkable and is a tragedy. It cannot be allowed to happen. No, and it won't be allowed to happen. I've got absolutely no doubt about that at all. We're going to survive. It's just a question of what we do before we get to what we all want it to be. And things will change. And perhaps we've got to be ready to, to do some things in a way that we have never done before. Or perhaps, um, you know, be more thoughtful about how to take our art artistry out into the community, the wide community. Um, and, and, you know, I'm thinking about this all the time. Um, we do that, of course. It's, we've always done that with the Hallett. It has the most wonderful program of reaching out into the community of all ages, going yeah. to different people's homes and schools and that sort of thing. It's very important that we don't sit in our temple and expect everybody to come and worship at our shrine. That, to me, is anathema. Let them come and let them great time together in the concert. But there's a whole other side to what we have to do, to yes. bring the idea of music, to get people not to be shy or to feel that it's not for them. Um, you don't have to have a degree to enjoy this. You just have to have an open heart. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much for giving so much time. And it's a joy. And you and I could share so much. We've known each other a long while. And whatever happens immediately, I'm sure that the time will come when we will walk on stage again together. And I send you my love and best wishes. Lots of love. Bye. Bye.